Docker. Let's save that. So there it is. And we'll give it a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And this, as, as this will be recorded, I do believe that there will be quite a few that will be listening to the recording later, no? So, mm -hmm. so let's see. Hello, Suzanne. Hi, Hello. how are you? I'm doing wonderful, thank you. And yes. you? I have you. Nice to see you, I mean. It's <laughs> good to see you, eh? Very nice yeah. to see you. Wonderful. Feeling good? Yeah, much better. Thank you. I'm alive again. Thank God. Yeah. I know. I know it's been a, <laughs> must have been a few tough months there, no? It, it's tough. It's, it's, not a, it's not an easy illness. And um, I'm sure there are many other people who've been through it, but it's, um, it's, it's, a no, it's no joke. Yeah. You know, I think South Africa has behaved very similar to Mexico, no? We're living more or less the same, the same the time. Same curve, but, yeah. yeah, same thing. Yeah, I was listening. Your statistics are one in two at the moment are testing positive. Ours are 4.3, one in 4.3. Okay. But the thing with us is that, that there's so few people being tested that it's, that's yeah. a problem, no, the tests. Yeah. You know what? I don't think it's a problem, Armando. I think it's actually a, a blessing because um, if we knew how many people were really positive, I think we'd be a lot more afraid. More afraid. <laughs> probably right, no? Yeah. Probably right. Safe. Yeah. Today I, I was reading that there was one person in Hong Kong who was found to be um, uh, infected for the second time, no? Um, which is something we had. Thank you for that. Just what I needed to hear. Thank you. <laughs> no, but the thing you should know, there's one in so many million, no? So, and, and, and then the, in, doctors are saying this is the proof, the exception that makes the rule stand, no? There are a few people in Cape Town who are on their second round as well. So it's, it's very worrying. They oh, yeah. don't know how long the immunity is. Some doctors say, if you get it, you're immune for three months or five months. I don't think they know. We don't know enough. I think we don't know what we don't know. You're right. But I'm optimist. And as I'm always, I'm an optimist. I think this, this location in the world will, will make us be better. And there's going to be a, a lot of breakthroughs. I, I really hope, no? We hope, yeah. But at the same time, the other truth that I know is that this is showing just how unequal the world is. And, and, and we have such a tremendous responsibility. I think all the YPOs in the world, we have uh, things to do here to change the trajectory. But that's my opinion. I don't need to be messing with my opinion with art, no? <laughs> <laughs> Anita, uh, it's um, 11 right now sharp. Um, I'd like to maybe give it one more minute. There's, there's a few who have already joined, but I want to be very respectful of, of everyone's time. And then Certainly. Uh, I will be admitting people as, as, uh, as we begin, you know? But, yeah, that's fine. It usually needs to give them a few minutes, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, I forgot. I've got to get on and all of that. Yep, I'll give it a few minutes. That's fine. Five after. Sorry, Anita, we were being very rude. I didn't greet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> it was well, and I, I hate to uh, trivialize COVID with a discussion of something so trivial as art, but 
No, it's not at all. Something that gives us purpose and meaning, actually. Exactly. There's more joining, so I'll give it again a couple more minutes and then we'll be here. Yeah. Mute. Yes. <laughs> the important power of mute. Look at that. There is Samira joining. For, for everyone who, who's already here, we're just waiting one or two minutes to, to see how many more will be joining and, uh, and, and we'll begin. So just please hang in for, for a few more seconds. Hello. Hola, Victoria. Hello, Armando. Nice to meet you. Yeah, very nice to meet you too. See your face. Good. Yes, thank you Anna, so much. Angelo, hola. See a lot of good friends, eh? This is what art brings to the table, Anita. A lot of really good friends here. Um, then just stay on the computer until the next lesson. Hello. Hey, Samira. Hola. Hi. Hola. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Wonderful. Natalie. Still a few more joining. I think we should get started, Anita. Um, and what I will do is ask uh, everyone who's in the call to please mute their their the Zoom um, just to keep Anita's. Um, and it, well, first of all, I, I don't think we've done a lot of uh, GCCs or webinars in the YPOR network, so. Um, I'm very pleased, very happy that this will be our first webinar in a series that we will be doing throughout uh, the whole year. Um, my name is Armando Beltran, and I'm, uh, as of July the 1st, the chair for the Art Network. Um, and I'm very pleased to be um, helping, being the master of ceremonies, if you will, uh, on, on this first webinar um, with Anita Heriot. And I want to uh, share with everyone um, who Anita is, so everyone's because um, she's, she's helped um, and uh, educated YPOers on this topic uh, in the past through the Personal Investment Network. Anita is president of Paul Moll Art Advisors, a tangible asset management firm. Um, she's a nationally sought, sought out speaker in the States, she lives in New York, and she has lectured at the Barons 100 and 500 summits to over 30 chapters of Tiger 21, who I'm sure that many of you know, they're a high net worth learning network. Um, and then of course, the investment forum of YPO, as I said, and some other uh, top organizations with uh, CEOs, um, bankers, attorneys, insurance, etc. cetera. Uh, she's a member of the Appraisers Association of America and, a certified, uh, and certified to the uniform standards of professional appraisal practice. Um, she has testified as specialist witness in major court cases, which um, really interesting involving art valuations and uh, regularly lectures on topics relating to art collection and appraising. She grew up in a family of art collectors um, and she was sharing with me yesterday as we were going over on her grandfather. So I'll let her speak to that a little bit. She's a graduate of uh, Baudouin University uh, with advanced degrees from the University of London and New York University. And she started her career at Sotheby's uh, in New York, uh, spent a few years as an independent appraiser, joined Ger Jones as an appraiser in the New York office before uh, starting Paul Mall 
uh, art advisors uh, about 10 years ago. And um, with that, um, I welcome you, Anita, um, to our network. We will be recording this. We're, um, the, the logistics for this is Anita will be presenting um, through the next 20, 30 minutes. I will be interacting with her at times, making sure that we're taking in um, take-home value, uh, wipe your take-home value. And what I would kindly request is if anyone has questions at any point in time, please be including those in the chat. And I will be making sure that the questions are asked. No, so I'll be moderating, if you will. So thank you, Anita, and the floor is all yours. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here and to uh, speak with all of you. And it's really exciting, especially the fact that you're global. Um, that makes it so much more fun because you bring a lot more perspective uh, to this, this discussion. So it's very much appreciated. Let me talk a little bit about kind of how I'm, I've shaped this conversation. Number one, uh, COVID has had a major impact and I really want you to get a sense of that. Just bothering you, the sound? You sure. Uh, um, can you guys hear me? Is everything yeah. good? Yes, everything good, Gordon. Again, for those who just entered, we will ask you to please mute the phones and um, so that Anita has the, the line. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to focus very much on the impact of COVID. You do have to have some sense of where I'm coming from, um, what my perspective is. We're really a tangible asset management firm. And what that really means is that we manage our clients' valuable collections. So I come to this discussion from a couple different perspectives. One, um, from the perspective of making sure that um, our clients uh, use due diligence whenever they're looking to buy or sell art. So COVID is impacting that due diligence. It also, I come very much from a financial perspective. So while a lot of you very much are interested in art for art's sake, for supporting local artists, the focus of this conversation will not be on that. It's really looking at the art market. Um, that being said, I really encourage you to ask questions, um, any questions. Let's consider this a dialogue and a conversation. Um, and let's begin. So we're gonna look at uh, three major topics. One, what was life before COVID? And I remember the moment, right, when we realized that we would have to change the way our company did business um, and how we'd have to kind of reorganize when we understood COVID was going to be the new art reality. What impact did COVID have on the spring market? Very interesting. Absolutely fascinating. We'll talk a bit about that. What's the fall looking like? You know, I think in the spring we were all thinking, oh, we'll be out of it in the fall. Alas, that is not the case. <laughs> and we have had to relook at the fall as have all the auction houses and galleries and museums. And then what does the future bring? So those are kind of the main topics, but within those topics, we'll be looking at a lot of other important components. Okay, so let's just look at what life was like before and what was life like in the spring. So what we're looking for is really January as kind of the starting point of the new year up until the, the end of the sales in July. So really January to July, what's happened to the art market? And let's explain what that means. So the first thing to understand that in 2019, when life was normal, and we just had to deal with all the normal chaos of society, it was a very, very good year in the art world, right? There was about $5.6 billion in sales. Um, and online was a very small component a very small component of sales. Really, it was for the dregs of society, right, in the art world. So things that were put online, were things that weren't appropriate for the significant sales. Um, I was joking last night with Armando that, you know, in uh, March of this year, if anyone had said to me someone would be buying a $40 million work of art online, I would have told them they were insane, right? But alas, that has changed, right? People are buying $40 million works of art online. Now let's look at 2020. So look at the dramatic change, right? It's an overall decrease of about 50% in sales in the auction marketplace. So we're down to like 2.88 billion. But look at online sales. Online sales have increased dramatically. And we've gone from 69 to $412 million in sales online. So that's a 497% increase. So for all of you that are invested in online art, related um, companies, it could be a very interesting play to see how that proceeds over time. 
Now, let's look at the auction houses. I mentioned I'm, I'm former Sotheby's. And as you know, there are three major auction houses. And there's been a lot of change in these auction houses over the last three years. Um, there's new ownership. Uh, Sotheby's went from a publicly traded company to a privately traded company, which allows them a lot more leverage and movement without as much inspection from the public. Um, Phillips is heavily invested, so they have a lot of money to burn, and they've used that as a way to encourage people to sell at Phillips. It's kind of the, the youngest brother trying to catch up with the two older brothers. And then Christie's has traditionally been the dominant auction house, particularly with post-war contemporary. Sotheby's and Christie's battling it out, but Christie's kind of was, was stronger last year. So you can see there's been a change, right? Sotheby's um, had a decrease um, in overall sales, about 37%, and Christie's took the biggest hit. And there's, there's kind of a reason for it. Soon as COVID hit, when I said all of our companies, and I'm sure you're the same, you've thought about your companies, what were you going to do and what were you going to change? Sotheby's immediately got online. They had already invested a lot of money in their online platform and they got sales online as quickly as possible. And all of us hungry little caterpillars who love to buy were just tapping our button like crazy, dying to do something as we were sitting at home um, and were buying quite significantly at auction. And Christie's kind of was followed behind trying to figure out what are we gonna do? How are we gonna handle online sales? How are we gonna define ourselves? And as a result, Christie's sort of lagged behind until um, the 20th century sale, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, which was their July sale. And again, if someone had said to me last March, guess what, the big sales will happen in July, I again would have told them they were out of their mind, no one buys art in July, but most of the big sales this year were in fact in July for, for the obvious reasons. Now, what we found, um, which again is no really big surprise with one exception, that post-war contemporary still reigns supreme. Um, what that really means is that most of the buying, the really big sales are happening in the post-war contemporary market. Now, I don't know if I need to define post-war contemporary, but let me just make sure everyone is on the same page. Post-war contemporary really refers to post-World War II, so that's post-war, when the emergence of abstract expressionism um, begins to take um, hold on the development of art history. And that leads to pop art and then so on and so forth. So we're looking at post-World War II. Um, so that really reigns supreme. Although if you see, you know, there was still a significant drop from 2019. The area that took the biggest hit was modern and impressionism. And there's kind of a reason for that. And I've thought a lot about it and I'm, I'm pretty clear. <laughs> The reason is primarily because of who tends to own modern and impressionist paintings. It tends to be an older generation. You know, younger people don't tend to be attracted, especially to impressionism in 19th century paintings, with some exception. I happen to love them myself, but with some exception. And, you know, that's a more conservative um, owner, collector. They don't want to put things in the market if they're tenuous and worried about it. So actually supply significantly dropped for quality works within Impressionism and Modernism. In addition, the Asian marketplace has traditionally been the biggest buyers of Modern and Impressionism. As a result, Asian market had really kind of constricted and wasn't interested in acquiring um, Modern and Impressionist paintings. And again, it still was, you know, it still was a $508 million spring, but compared to last year, it's a pretty significant drop. Now, um, I thought I would kind of alert you to where we saw, which was an incredible surprise to all of us. I mean, here we were all thinking there are going to be no auction houses that are live. No one's going to be sitting in a seat and raising a paddle, which is traditionally how you acquired works. Who is going to do, who are the, who's going to see the works in person? You know, will there be condition reports done by a third party? I mean, all of these questions that we had going into the spring, everyone had. Um, that being said, what they developed was something called hybrid sales. And what the hybrid sales really mean is that if you were a big buyer, you could see the pieces in person, you could send your conservator to do condition reports. Videos were used as a very popular way to share um, paintings so that you could see them. You know, you always worry, and it is a fact, that you know, they're tampered with, that the light changes, that that's not actually how they look. So having a video is a very good way to see these artworks. 
And some of the kind of exceptional sales that kind of blew all of us out of the water were the Ginny Williams sale, um, which you know was a sale of abstract expressionism primarily and had a $59 million revenue. But the really interesting sale, and talking to the YPO Global Network, for you guys, if you didn't follow this sale, go online to Christie's and take a look at the sale. It was called the One Global Sale. It's never been done before. And essentially what it did is like, is they followed the sale through time, starting going to all the centers of the art world. I literally get chills when I think about it. And each sale, so Hong Kong, then Paris, then London, and then finally ending in New York. What an incredible sale. Now, the artworks that were brought to the sale, because we, you know, Christie's came to us requesting certain artworks from our clients because they really needed this to be a slam dunk. They were watching Sotheby's, you know, gain very significantly in the market. They needed some big, big sales. And, you know, it was a mixture of dealer material, pieces that are fresh to the market. Christie's pumped a lot of money into this sale um, and it was quite successful right, exceeding $420 million. So that's, that's a successful sale. So in a world where we're thinking what's gonna happen to the art world, in fact, prices were very strong with certain kinds of artwork. Prices were very strong for works that were fresh to the market, means we all hadn't seen them before and been shopped around between dealers and art advisors, et cetera, so, or hadn't gone unsold at auctions or fresh to the market. And they really had all of those categories of analysis, which I'll discuss, which really make an A-plus work. In addition, in our next series, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, the guarantee, and I don't know if you know what that is, the guarantee played a very big role in these sales. Um, so essentially, the guarantee is if you have an artwork that's priced well, not too high, the estimate's not too high, and the, in this COVID era, people are afraid their work's gonna go unsold. All of us know that unsold works are burned to the market. It's a, it is the death knell to a painting. So a guarantee is basically a third party individual or firm, sometimes a dealer, who says, you know what? I like that work. If I end up with this work, I'm fine with it. I'm going to guarantee it at a certain price. And that way the seller relaxes, right? And then the potential buyer who has the guarantee can benefit from the upside. So essentially what that means, if there's a four to $6 million work and a guarantee is for $4 million, if it sells for $6 million, that $2 million upside is shared with the owner and the guarantor. So it's actually a financial way to make a lot of money of, what we, of which we did for our clients during this period of COVID. And in fact, in the fall, we will be getting guarantees for our work. So those are some of the reasons why the market is strong. It's not just because people are tapping their button. It's because people are seeing opportunity as well. And here's a great example. This was in the Ginny Williams sale. This is a Joan Mitchell, and it's an A quality work. Again, I'll tell you what that actually means. But the estimate was four to six million dollars, and then it sold for 7.9. That's what you want to see in a COVID era, right? You want to see good works selling for a decent amount of money above estimate. Now, where are we seeing decline in value? Um, and I really hope that, you know, I know a lot of you just love art but I really want you to also think a little bit away the way you're all kind of success, successful business people. If you could put that business hat on and start to think about these acquisitions in that way as well, as part of your portfolio, as part of your legacy to your children, it's important to understand where we're seeing a decrease in value. So the first thing we're seeing is that works of art that I call kind of B minus C or D rated works, and I'll explain what that means, that market is not very good for those works, right? They're going unsold. And, you know, we're seeing about, mm, there's a slight decrease in, in post tour contemporary, about a 5% uh, decrease in um, unsolds in the marketplace. So the, the lower value works that aren't of good quality, people don't see them as assets. People aren't necessarily just buying for decoration if they're spending $100,000 or more, that market's down. Where we're seeing a really low drop in the market is for emerging artists, with some exception. When we say emerging artists, we mean artists that are living artists. They're not mid-career artists. So if you, a mid-career artist is someone that's in museums, represented by serious galleries, right? Potentially has a secondary market, probably has a secondary market. 
Emerging artists are generally represented by a gallery, have little to no auction market pricing, almost none, and um, generally have almost no asset value. Now, in 2011 to 2014, this was a period when a lot of hedge fund guys and gals and venture capitalists and just newly wealthy individuals bought emerging artists with the hope that they could flip them and make money. And they did in some respect and for no good reason. And what we've seen is those prices have collapsed. So artists that they paid you know, a lot of money for in 2011, 2012, 2013, that market is terrible. And the reason is because it's, and I don't want to say it like this because again, I apologize that I speak, I think with a financial head, all right? I'm not thinking about my love for my love of artists. Um, it's kind of like a penny stock, right? Potentially it could go up in value, but it probably won't because it doesn't have those characteristics that typically create an asset value artist. Or any artist with no secondary market has also declined in value. So we have seen decline in value without a doubt. Anita, now, well, well, while you go through that, let me ask you a question. Can you give us, and not to put you on the spot, but one or two examples of emerging artists that you saw that happen right now? Sure. So I'll, I'll give you an example of um, a whole collection I just reviewed um, two days ago. Uh, the client acquired an entire collection of about 35 artists. All of them are emerging artists, meaning they're living, they're represented with, two, with the exception of two artists. They're, only, they're represented by galleries that may go out of business, right? They're, they're not commercially focused galleries that are kind of the power galleries like, you know, um, you know, Zorner or Gagosian. And um, we know what he paid for them because we have his receipts. And we, our job, um, because it happens to be a court case, is we have to figure out what in fact is the current asset value in for this particular estate. And what we have found is that on average, 95% of the artists that he acquired for investment, and it was an investment quality collection, apparently, he was told, um, 90 by five, this is how the algorithm we have to use for value is whatever he paid, it's 80% decrease in value for fair market value for those artists. So here you're talking about an 80% decrease in every single artist with exception of one, because they have no secondary market, they're not represented by a serious gallery, um, and have no asset value. So um, we see this every day, all day, every day. Um, and it is a real, again, it's okay to buy artists you love. That's a wonderful thing to do. And when a client says to me, but I love buying artists that are in my community. And I say, that's great. If you wanna buy asset value, let's look at your overall budget. Let's devote 75% to asset quality work and let's take 25% and let's make this the charitable portion of your portfolio and let's support artists. Um, so in terms of modern impressionism where I gave you the sad story, what we saw was again, older people, they, don't, they did not, older collectors did not wanna put works in the market, it was too scary. The sell through rate was down about 5%. That meant that if a work goes for sale, it could go unsold. So it went to about 75% sell-through rate, meaning 25% of the works that went for sale went unsold, which is a terrible thing for an artwork. Um, but there's actually a good story within the sad story. And it's the same story every single time, COVID or no COVID. The best examples of modern impressionist works that came to market did extraordinarily well. Again, that's just the story that is always told. And that's why I tell clients, spend the most you can afford within the categories of analysis if you've done your due diligence. And the real winners were female artists, which we have continued to see for the last two years, and surrealists. In terms of the female artists, and this is across post-war contemporary, modern impressions, even old master paintings. So if you track sales, Female artists have significantly world, world records we have seen throughout the sales over the last two years for female artists, and that's continued today. Um, I thought it would, I was in love with the um, Magritte that you can see behind us. I think it's 
phenomenal. Um, and I was dying for a client to buy it, <laughs> but I knew it would go very expensive and it did. It sold for, you know, way above estimate um, in that one global sale that I mentioned to you. And here's some very interesting um, new world records for artists and they're surrealist artists and um, several of them were women. And we were just so excited to see these records. When we saw the works, we knew something special was gonna happen because again, the quality was so high, um, but it was an incredible um, amount of excitement over these works. And then also we saw a tremendous, beautiful, uh, with Fredo Lamb go uh, up for sale and sold very, very well. Again, the most ever sold for one of his works. So surrealism dominates. One of the reasons surrealism, I think, um, is so strong is because I think it crosses generations. I think that a younger collecting um, generation really appreciates surrealism. Um, and we've seen that again and again over the last, you know, three or four years. And I just I thought I'd show you the regions where we're seeing the greatest activity in um, artwork acquisition. And again, if you were to look at 2015, this would look different. Uh, China would be much bigger. Um, London would be about the same. And at one point, China actually exceeded, um, was had a much, you know, spent more money than any other place in the world, even over New York. But again, New York reigns supreme again. Now, don't we find that interesting considering New York in the spring was literally shut down? There was not one door open for one visitation with the exception of the few of these sales where you could see them privately. I mean, the gallery market was shut down, no one went to art fairs, and yet New York still um, continues to be the center of the art world. And I think that's primarily due to wealth, right? I think the very, very wealthy are still spending money on important works of art. Now, I thought I would just take you back to where I was in January. We had lots and lots of calls. We were very worried about the spring market and we didn't even know Corona existed. We were watching the Brexit um, debate and we thought, oh my God, there goes the European and British market. We're gonna be, this is gonna be a real problem. And then the demonstrations started in Hong Kong and went, oh my God, <laughs> we've got the demonstrations in Hong Kong. We've got the situation with Brexit. The market is going to be very unstable. And we were pleasantly surprised with, you know, January and February sales and then Corona hit. So it was like the trifecta, right, of, of unstable kind of activity in the art marketplace. And it really is a delicate balance. However, in addition to COVID, in addition to any of the other disruption we've seen, we now have a new disruption and that is the American election. Um, they have tracked the impact over the American election on the art market over time. And it has demonstrated over and over again that the art market um, shrinks when there's an election. There's a lot of instability about the economy. There's a lot of worry. I know everyone on the, on the call is not American, obviously, but one of the main areas that Americans get nervous is in terms of like their estate tax. And I know that's not something all of us think about, but it's gonna shrink potentially, you know, way down to 2 million. Right now it's at 11 million per person. So people are thinking about their assets and you know, what are they gonna do with them? And are they gonna be taxed? And what's gonna happen to the stock market? So we have COVID, we have the election, um, as all part of the instability that we're dealing with right now and its impact on the market. So I'll show you kind of a little bit how the market works and why this instability can have both an opportunity for buyers, but can be a problem for sellers. So within this ecosystem, um, and you can see it right here very clearly, we have the auction houses, we have the collectors, we have your art advisors, your independent art advisors, your dealers, synonym gallery, and your museums. So you have all of these different players, right, actors in this play, and they all are symbiotic. They're all completely, anyone that says a museum has nothing to do with the value of artwork knows nothing about the relationship between the art market and museums. So let's look at that first impact. If a museum shuts down, and cannot have their blockbuster exhibitions or their exhibitions for artists that you may not have heard of before, 
What impact does that have on the art market? Well, let's give an example. When we saw the Denver Art Museum feature women abstract expressionists three years ago, three or four years ago, basically they featured both known abstract expressionists and abstract expressionists that weren't known as well, like your Grace Hardigans. People didn't know who Grace Hardigan was. What did that do? Well, that exhibition had a massive impact on a renewed focus on female abstract artists. So artists like Helen Frankenthaler and Joe Mitchell and Lee Krasner started to climb, 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 climb. And then that second tier artists like Elaine de Kooning and Grace Hardigan, we started to see them move more and more in the marketplace. And that was because of a museum exhibition. So what happens when museums don't have exhibitions? Well, that impacts the value of artists. That's a big problem. Now, what happens when galleries shut down? When galleries shut down and they're not exhibiting the artwork of clients, right, of artists, and people can't buy that artwork, right, that has a huge impact on the development and movement of artists in the, e in the ecosystem. And guess who are one of the major buyers at auction? Oh, dealers. And if dealers can't buy at auction, then the auction prices will go down. So the dealer marketplace is very much tied up with auction sales. In addition, the dealers are a lot of the, they filter a lot of the material to the exhibitions and they have relationships with museums to build up their artists. So again, very, very much related. The impact then on art advisors who aren't buying at auction, they're not buying from dealers, they're not getting things that they own for clients into museum, all of that impacts. So as a result, if this ecosystem tips out of balance, that can have a devastating impact on the value of artwork. So let's, let's take a little look. So let's look at the gallery market. And I'm giving you an example of David Zwerner and he's a powerhouse gallery, right? So he's what we call a market maker. So he is a dealer that the artists that he represents very much have the best chance of becoming asset value artists that going into museums, right? That have a secondary market. What happened to Zwerner? Well, immediately they set up what's called online viewing rooms. Nobody was going in to their galleries. What else did they do? Well, they laid off a lot of staff. So staff is laid off, they go online, they, um, in the art fairs like Freeze and Basel, they have online positioning on the art fairs and they start doing a lot of private deals. So what we've seen with the galleries is a lot of secondary private deals with their private clients and other, um, other galleries, particularly in secondary market artists. So what does that mean? They may represent artists that have never gone to auction, but they're doing a lot of deals with artists that are what we call blue chip artists, right? So they've become kind of art advisors in a lot of respects. They've gone online and they've had to lay off a lot of their staff. Now, what do I think? I think these, artists, these galleries will be just fine. The David Zwerners of the world, the Gagosians of the world, the Mnuchins of the world. I think they're gonna be absolutely fine. What I don't think will be fine will be all the second and third tier galleries. Our regional galleries that we go to when we're in Carmel or wherever we are, you know, they depend on people going on vacation. They depend on people buying passion assets, right? They just, oh, I like it, I'll buy it. So they depend on people going to the secondary art fairs, right? Like Art Miami. So I anticipate those galleries to have a real tough time in this marketplace. The really difficult story is the museum story. Um, and we're gonna see several things happen with museums. First of all, uh, a survey was done and they continue to do these surveys, but one out of three museums they believe will not survive. Now, a lot of these museums are like children's museums, science museums, right? Not as much the art museums, but the smaller art museums will also suffer significantly, especially those museums that have restrictions on sale. So, if you donate to a museum, any of you, artworks, um, if you don't tell them don't sell this and it's not written into the clause, they have the right to sell that artwork within a few years of ownership. And that's how a lot of museums make money, right? So you may think you're donating it, it's gonna be sitting in the museum forever, it won't. It will be sold, 
um, chances are it will be sold unless it's written in to the document, the, the, the actual donation agreement. If it is, however, written in the agreement and a lot of the best clients with the best art will say you can't sell it. And so they can't sell it. Um, but they will, we will see more and more museums deaccessioning their collections. From a buying perspective, I'm like, yay. But from a museum perspective, it's, it's tough, tough to hear those words, right? In addition, looking at the museums and doing another survey, they found 80%, 7% of museums have only 12 months left in their financial reserve. So you're going to see a lot of online auctions, a lot of charitable online auctions for museums. If you get on any of the major um, sites like Bid Square or Live Auctioneers or um, Invaluable, you'll see a lot of charitable donations online to support museums. So that's, you know, that's what's going to happen. This ecosystem is going to be out of balance. That is my prediction. I predict we'll have about 35% less galleries at the end of this. I predict we're going to have, you know, maybe 30% less museums. And then a lot of these art fairs, which were riding the economic wave, right, are going to be eliminated. So you could see them in Dallas or Seattle, or I mean, everyone had an art fair. I think the, you know, the cream will rise to the top, the top art fairs will continue, but I think a lot of these secondary art fairs will, will disappear because the galleries will disappear that sold in them. Let's look at some of the winners and losers in the COVID era. So the winners, female artists. Can female artists continue to be very, very interesting in the marketplace? We look very carefully at female artists. I've been following Lee Krasner, um, who is a fantastic abstract expressionist for many years, predicting she would be um, increase in value, and she has quite significantly. Um, works that are priced at the right price, mean at, a low, at auction, price low, and are fresh to the market will make a tremendous amount of money, right? If their quality works. And African-American artists, we see such a renewed interest, and this isn't this year with Black Lives Matter, but it helps. It's over time, over the last four or five years, there's been a tremendous interest in Black, black artists. And there actually is, for the first time ever, an auction house specifically devoted to Black artists. And this is called Black Art Auctions. They had their first auction in May. Um, they had a works on paper auction in July. And um, as an example, this Sam Gilliam, who's already a very known artist in the marketplace, um, you know, sold for $905,000. So that just, you know, brings me a lot of hope and a lot of excitement around this area of the marketplace. Where do we see the losers in the marketplace? And this is from a sale perspective. Pieces that are placed in the market and are overpriced are going unsold, period. So, you know, they put gallery prices on them. It's not, <laughs> we're not in 2015, right? This is COVID 2020. Overpriced works will not sell in the market. You have to get, you know, galvanized interest. And then works that are guaranteed, remember I talked about the guarantees at high estimates are just being sold at the guarantee. Right, so the losers are people who don't know how to sell right. It's kind of that simple in this market. So what does the fall look like? Okay, things are somewhat the same and somewhat different. Christie's has done a fascinating thing and they keep trying to redefine um, who they are. They have created a new thing called the 20th century sale. So what the 20th century sale actually means, it's looking at turn of the century Picasso essentially right up through post-war contemporary. And they're creating these blockbuster sales that follow the trajectory of art history in the 20th century. Um, and they mix in, in a very curated way, the artworks that speak to each other. So it's, it's an absolutely fascinating way um, to kind of create interest in impressionism and modernism, right? It, basically what they're doing is what we all need to do. So many of the buyers today have never taken a class in art history. They don't know the trajectory or survey of art history. They don't know who influenced, if you're interested in Jonah, you know, uh, Jonas Wood, or if you're interested in um, you know, any of the major artists that are you know, a Marshall, you know, they don't know that they were impacted by artists before them. So the 20th century sale is in some respect doing the work that an art history class is supposed to do, create context. Um, Anita? Yes. Hello, can I ask you a question? Of course. What's, what's your opinion on Latin American art? 
in, so, in, this, in this scenario? Yeah, absolutely. So what we're very excited about, and that's why I wanted to share with you those, those, um, those recent sales results um, for some of the Latin American artists. And I also know that, um, and again, this is like the best of the best of the best, but you know, recently there was a, a sale of a Frida Kahlo privately that went more than any Frida Kahlo has ever sold for it during COVID, right? So there's still immense interest in Latin American art. However, for Latin American artists that are what I call global blue chip artists, so that means they have global marketplaces and the only, and the buyers aren't just Latin American buyers, right? For those artists, I see a huge trajectory, right? However, for regional artists, and I can do this, kind of express this in all contexts, whether you're an Irish regional artist, an American regional artist, which is pre, you know, like a pre, uh, an American impressionist artist, for instance, um, a Latin American artist that does not have a strong international secondary market. There is a direct correlation between the consumer confidence index for those particular regions and the prices for their regional artists. So what does that mean? So as an example in America, when our consumer confidence index is down, we don't buy regional artists because we're the only ones that buy them in the world. When the consumer confidence index is down in Argentina or Brazil, if they're the only buyers of that particular artist because they're regional, then there's gonna be a direct correlation with the market. So it's very important to track the individual countries uh, economic health with their desire to buy in a very patriotic way their own artists. So I always see it as a great buy opportunity when our economy is suffering. I'm an American painting specialist as an example. So I do deal with a lot of regional artists like Thomas Hart Benton and American Impressions. When our market tanks, I get excited because that's when I can buy the best of the best of our regional artists at a price that makes sense. So that's a very broad way of discussing it because we have, this is a, you know, we have so many people from so many countries, but I think that's a realistic way of looking at Latin American artists. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we'll continue to see um, our specialty sales, which I just referenced, you know, the regional artists, but again, we're tracking the health of each country. Art fairs will be online. So like one of the things we're doing, because they're online, that is a very tricky way to buy art right it's it's very risky in many respects you're looking at kind of photos that may have been doctored up right you don't have a lot of due diligence going into those acquisitions so we're really advocating that clients slow down find the works they're interested in and allow you know those that are intelligent and understand the market to do due diligence for them do condition reports you know um do the market analytics to determine if the price they're paying paying actually makes sense um, because this is a, and remember, art fairs are dealers, so you can have access to the dealers and get the information you need. But they will continue to have art fairs, you know, right through, I think, right through the fall. Um, I don't need to say this message over and over again, but the, when, when you're looking to acquire artwork, whether it's COVID or not, the cream always rises to the top. So you want to buy the best you can afford with discipline. I mean, my whole, I think there's a tagline on my, on my, um, signature that says, you know, my job is to bring discipline to the art world. We've got to bring some discipline because passion is beautiful, but passion and emotion can prevent us from doing the discipline we need to do to acquire works that are part of the legacy for our families. So here's the, actually, if we just ended with this and you just know this, then I can sleep well at night. Um, and here's a good example of an artwork that came up for sale um, very recently in the, I think it was Sotheby's or Christie's uh, post-work impressionist sale. This Sam Francis has an A plus rating. And what does that mean? So I call it the ABC rule when we look at artworks. So first thing you wanna ask yourself is who's the artist? And you have to ask yourself one question. Does this artist sell in the secondary market? Which means do they have a consistent, and I have to say consistent, because if they only have three results and the results are the price within the estimate, it's usually a dealer falsely bidding on them to get them to where they need to be for emerging artists. So you need a consistent, long-term secondary market record. 
So ask yourself, who's the artist? What's the medium? The more original, the more original, the more valuable. So what does that mean? An oil on canvas, with some exception, will typically be the most expensive for an artwork for an artist, right? And a lithograph, an assigned lithograph, the least, the least valuable. So look at the medium in determining the price point, the size. If it's very, very large, so we just had a work of art that um, like a Hollywood type needed to sell. It was huge, huge, but a decent artist. It's actually harder to sell, right? Really big works are hard to sell. Really small works will never have a huge value beyond a certain price point. You want that sweet spot, right? Just think about what you like to look at in a painting. The date is probably, I might put that almost at the top, right at the top, which is what is the date in which the artwork is painted? So ask yourself one question. When was Sam Francis important in the development of art history? When is the artist you're looking at, and again, here's that problem with not knowing anything about art history, when is that artist contributed to the way we look at art? How did he, he or she change it? That's the date that will always have the most value. So if you go into a gallery and they're like, oh, don't you love this Helen Frankenthaler? And you're like, oh, it's gorgeous. And it's a late work, right, from 1980s. It will never have the value of one of the early works um, with when they developed, when she first was part of the abstract expressionist movement. Subject matter. So we see a lot of clients that have Picassos and have Gauguin and have Giacometti. And there are these portraits that have nothing to do with why the artist is important. So for instance, if you track the Andy Warhol market, a lot of wealthy people had Andy Warhol do their portrait, but we don't know who those, well, those wealthy people are. So those portraits will, even if they're original works, will never have a great value, right? So the subject matter has to be related to why that artist is important in the development of art history. And another word for subject matter is form, right? So form and subject matter. Condition. This is the problem with online. Condition can be literally, it can make a work worth zero. It's very, very important. If you're going to spend over a hundred or $200,000, you've got to have a condition report. And in addition, you have to have someone who knows what a condition report is, review the condition report. If you don't know the condition, especially if it's a work pre-1945, it could have potentially been repainted. It could have had significant problems and tears. It's like a human, right? Over time, we need work. And it, you know, and so therefore, make sure you have a condition report. Don't buy anything unless you can track the provenance. Um, if it has no provenance, don't buy it. Even if it's a friend who says he, he inherited it or someone gave it, don't even consider it. I looked at a whole collection yesterday from Florida, an entire collection. A gentleman sent it to me. He said, I've been offered this collection. What do you think? And I said, if you have sneakers, start running. Because the provenance was absolutely missing and the artists were important. So it would take thousands and thousands of dollars to do the due diligence on those artworks. Rarity. Again, an addition of 1,000 versus an addition of 10 will have a dramatically different value. A work of art that um, is new to the market or is very rare is going to be incredibly valuable. So rarity is important. Sales history. It is amazing how few clients do the, don't do the simple due diligence, just see, has this ever sold at auction? You know where dealers buy, especially second and third tier dollar dealers? They buy unsold works at auction. So if a work is estimated at you know, 100 to 150 and it goes unsold, the reserve was probably 80,000. It didn't sell at the reserve. The dealer probably bought it for 60. So if they're charging you $300,000, if you go to get an asset valuation for divorce or fair market, it's gonna be worth $60,000 no matter what you paid. So you must know the sales history of an artwork. And last but not least, you wanna see, has it been in any important exhibitions? Is there literature around the work? And most importantly, is it in the catalog resume? So essentially, if you have an A next to each of these categories of analysis, you have what I call a museum quality work. People say like, why did that go for so much money? It's because it had an A next to all of those categories of analysis. If you have some Bs and some As and then a couple of Ds, know that that probably 
is going to be, you know, average it out. It's going to be, you know, a, a B, B plus kind of work. So asset value investment quality is directly correlated to this ABC rule. Okay, quite simple. And keep, you know, as I said, with this ecosystem unstable, there are going to be some opportunities for distressed art. One, there's gonna be a lot of supply hitting online and people can't keep up with all of the online sales. We do because we track every artist of interest. So they're gonna be some really good outliers. This is a great example, this NARA, this is an amazing example of a NARA and it sold below the low because it was just, it kind of, it didn't get the attention it deserved. It was kind of, you know, not in the auction that was getting the, you know, it was during COVID and, and it, was, it was a steal. Also, look for modern and impressionist works. The market's a little soft. You can get a beautiful Renoir at a, you know, again, with all those A's next to it, at a good price. A Baudin, a Sicily, um, you know, other modern artists, you know, Emile Nolde, uh, Gabriel Munter. You know, there's lots of opportunities for, for great, weight, great works coming to the market. And then regional artists, like I said, Track your regional artist. You know, I'm looking very carefully at American Impressionism, um, American Ashcan School, American Modernism, because that's my, that's my thing. And I'm looking for, you know, opportunities for my client. My modern and impressionist specialist is looking, you know, within her area of expertise. So um, here are a couple final thoughts. And it's very, and I wanted to give you an example of a, an artist that is doing very well in the market today, and that's Zhao Kai. Um, good example of a work that sold in July at Hong Kong Sotheby's for $13 million. Um, I think it's the fifth most ever for a Zhao Kai. So buy at the right price, and COVID is going to give you some great opportunities. Um, as you're selling, make sure you're selling in the right venue and you're selling at the right time. If you're buying, buy the absolute best you can afford. And when I say best, think of those categories of analysis. Be patient, don't just buy. Allow yourself to step back, do the due diligence, get the market analytics, have the condition report you know, looked at. Don't just, if someone pressures you, then it's not something you should buy. It'll, you know, chances are it's going to be fine and you're going to get it. November will be a little health check on the market. We have quite a few things selling in the November sales, so we'll be tracking that very carefully. And follow the ABC rule. If you do all of these things, you'll buy great works, um, or you can sell great works, and we'll see what happens with COVID. So um, thank you so much. I think we have time for some questions. So if yes. anyone- Yes, Anita, there is a couple of questions. My role was supposedly to ask you a take home value, but I think you've, given us so much take on value that my intervention was not necessary. However, there's a few questions here in the chat and I'll start with Suzanne. Suzanne asks first a question on how has photography fared in recent online auctions? Sure. And then she also had one uh, on investments for masters or contemporary in online, no? How did yes. they fare? So if you can answer first that one. Yeah, so photography is extremely tricky. You really need to be a specialist in photography to buy photography. And that's for anyone that kind of follows photography, you know why, right? Um, you know, we need to know, you know, when, what's the edition? Was it during the lifetime? You know, the, the different medium for the photography, all of that's incredibly important. Um, you're going to see a lot. So here's an interesting example. You have photography that are, you know, important photographers that are part of the development and oeuvre of art history, right? You have those those kinds of artists. But then you have to have that whole area of photography that's also what we call collectibles, right? So depicting stars and athletes, so photographers who are primarily journalists. In this kind of COVID era, what we see is a lot of people, i.e. men, are online and they're bidding like crazy for what I call collectible photography, right? So there was a huge sale a really interesting sale at um, Christie's recently, I think it's Christie's, of all photographs of American athletes um, done by one journalist. And it did very, very well. And I think that has to do with boredom and just inherent kind of hobby interest and a price point people could afford. If we push all those celebrity artists, I mean photographers aside, and we look just at the blue chip market, it comes down to that same point that I just made, which is about 
quality. Those same characteristics apply to foot photography. So great photography is still selling very well and it crosses some generational lines. Young people aren't afraid of photography like they are of impressionist painting. It goes very well in contemporary settings, unlike uh, impressionist painting or 19th century painting. So I think with photography, the most important thing is making sure you know what you're doing. I mean, we have a full-time photography um, specialist on staff because it's that tricky. Um, it, condition is like everything for photography. So, you know, just doing your due diligence and buying, uh, but I do think it's a good opportunity to buy, you know, good works, you know, at a decent price if you do your due diligence. Okay. Angelo and, and Susanna asked questions are again related to the online sales increase. No, uh, will the trend continue? Do you expect that to continue? And also oh. some specific art segments. Could you answer yeah, that? I think the trend is absolutely going to continue. I think the strongest trend will be in post-war contemporary. There is a new online company just showing emerging artists. Um, that's an incredibly, you know, that's just like a passion click, right? That is, there's no, there's no due diligence around any of that acquisition, but it is giving a venue for emerging artists um, to show their work. So I think that all the auction houses have embraced at this point, all of them have embraced online sales, all of them. And we all, all agree it's the new normal and I anticipate it to be the new normal forever. I mean, once you start crossing the line, people said the privacy, you know, you want the exclusivity of seeing the work. Once you've crossed the line and you sold, you know, $400 million in artwork in an auction, <laughs> you've changed the way we think about online sales. Um, you know, it's the gravitas that people kind of associated with buying in person, right? But um, I don't, I think it's the new normal. Okay, let me ask you one last question. There's one here that, how do you find from Richard um, Radnitschek, how do you find the diamond in the rough or rather the young but up and coming artists? Because yeah. a lot of the times they won't have all the different things that you showed in the provenance, I mean, all those things. It's a great question. And, it, and that's actually the, the fodder for a whole other seminar. But um, so here's the deal. Um, there are certain requirements that you must have. I would, let me put it this way. If I was at telling a client said to me, I really love emerging artists. Is there possible to buy something that may have a better chance than others of increasing in value over time? Then I would say you must have the following. They have to be represented by a major dealer because they're market makers. So if they're not represented by a major dealer, that's not, and it, it was the same in the 60s and 70s, right? When we look at a, a Joseph Albers, we're looking for, you know, Sidney Janis to have been the representative for, for that Albers, right? That is a very important correlation. So one, I would, if you're looking to buy living emerging artists, I would go to galleries that are market makers. And I can give you a list of those market makers at another time if you would like me to do so. You need them to be in museums. It's really important. And I don't mean their alumni museum where they went to college. They have to be in some significant museums. I would want them to have a minimum of 10 um, auction prices on, on some sales record at all. If you can't get that, you wanna see if any major collectors and the gallery will provide that information with you without giving names. If any major collectors own that artist. So, does a major collector own the artist? Are they represented by a major gallery? And do they have kind of a strong exhibition history? And I don't mean gallery exhibition. I mean, are they in museums? Those three components give you a leg up for potentially a value that would increase over time. Okay. We're, uh, thank you. That was very, uh, very good too. Uh, we're reaching closure for the webinar. I want to, uh, to do two things. First is remind everyone that uh, this has been recorded and will be posted for access to our YPOR network. Uh, and we will do that later today. Uh, second thing is we have an upcoming uh, part two of this series with Anita on, I think it's September the 22nd, right? Same time, 11 in the morning. Um, but we will be talking about art as a financial asset, right? Distressed assets and, uh, and all the implications with money and art, no? Which uh, I'm sure will be quite informative as this one. Um, and so uh, everyone's welcome to join. And most important, Anita, thank you very, very much. I think you did a fantastic job with a lot of take-home value that uh, we will try to 
capture somehow and share with the rest of the 2,500 uh, members all over the world. One of the things that I'm really proud is this is a very global network and that uh, continues to, to increase in reach. So thank you very, very much. And for everyone uh, across the world, um, well, my thanks um, and hope to see you soon. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, that's great, Armando. Thanks, Anita. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs>